I'd like to welcome you to the second uh, lecture in our guest lecture series this year. The announcements uh, are now out and you'll receive them in classes tomorrow. If you're not uh, a member of the College of Architecture and Planning, we'll be happy to uh, send you one or give you one. Uh, we have them in the office upstairs. I thought I might tell you, since we're going to hear a fable tonight from our speaker, I thought that my introduction might also be a fable. And I'd tell you a story about a, uh, myself for, for a minute. I started teaching 14 years ago down at North Carolina State College, and I had a very nice 8 feet by 16 foot office, and it was four, four foot modules, as I remember, very tough uh, space. And I shared it with a historian, Paul Buisson, and uh, he spent the majority of his uh, time pulling slides in the library. And if he wasn't there, he was doing uh, uh, correcting uh, papers at home so that I had an office to myself. And I was able to cram a couple students into the office to help me get my practice started at the same time I was teaching. Well, the following year, Paul moved out to a different office, and they brought in a young guy who'd just come from uh, Luke Kahn's office in Philadelphia. And uh, this guy was teaching a freshman design studio and a second year design studio. And one of the studios uh, had 20 students working with clay models of cities, all at the same scale. Somehow, that developed into a book of uh, cities all at the same scale. And the sophomores, at the same time, were working with uh, uh, drawings of houses, plans, and sections all at the same scale. And that also ended, in, uh, ended as a book. But it ended that we also had about 40 students in that office all the time. And all of those plates, and if you can imagine those, uh, those 20 clay, uh, clay models all over the office. Well, after you uh, hear Ricky Werman uh, talk tonight, and I promised that I would introduce him as Richard Saul Werman, when you uh, hear him tonight and you hear his varied interests, I think that you'll, you'll know what an exciting time we had uh, in that office. Uh, both of us as, as young uh, teachers teaching for the first time. Ricky graduated from uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he worked for Luke Kahn. He has been teaching off and on uh, since and lecturing at, at many places. And I'm very happy that we can have him back to Ball State for the second time, uh, Richard Saul Werman. deeply if a few of you with all the you well if you could move up front so I could see somebody because it really helps when I can have eye contact with somebody if a few of you could move up front I'd be much obliged I won't ask you questions especially or anything I'll just it just would be helpful thank you very much <clears throat> Well, I was going to start talking about something else, but Charlie Sapp saying that stuff about me. I'm not going to sit still for that. Well, it sounded like I was going to make... Norm? I could just pull it away a little bit. I was about 26, 27 when I went down to North Carolina. Um, cocky as hell. And uh, I thought I was really hot stuff. I had graduated from Penn and I was top student there and I went to work for Lou. And they asked me to come and teach, which was I thought was terrific. And uh, I didn't know what I was doing. 
and uh, I uh, started doing some problems where I was asking people to, to study some things. And the only way I could understand what they were studying is to have them so I could compare one to the other. And so I said, well, you know, we're going to do these models. We're going to study some cities, and we're going to study some the geometry of some cities. Let's all make them the same scale. Then they came out terrific, and I was a hero. I was so terrific because I decided to do that, and it was all accidental. And then I thought, well, I might as well make a career of this. And I did uh, first did that book because that was that was one of the student publications. It was we did these models of 50 towns and cities all over the world, and we made these just lovely little models. Uh, well, they weren't so little; some were very big. Just they were all to the same scale, and you know, uh, Peking was was that big, and uh, Palma Nuova was this big, and you know Venice was this big, and Philadelphia was this big, and they were all different sizes because they were all the same scale. And um, they looked terrific, so we decided to make it a student publication of my, of my class. And we put that together, and it was the most popular one they ever had. It was sold out in about, in about eight weeks, just word of mouth. It was on the cover of a Norwegian magazine whose title I can't even pronounce. And, and Casabella ran a full spread on it. Everybody thought it was just terrific. That, and I got letters saying, oh, these cities can't be the same scale because, I mean, obviously, these, you know, that this one's bigger than that. And, that. and luckily, they were, they were all right. Uh, we didn't make any mistakes. We could have. Very hard to find that information. It was hard generally, but particularly hard in North Carolina. Um, well, I thought this was so terrific that everybody understood things they'd never understood before because things were sort of comparative. And uh, they had done a book called Building Footprints out of there a number of years, a few years earlier, Eduardo Sacristi. I think he's now in Puerto Rico, I'm not sure. And uh, that also had plans, just plans of cities to the same scale. So I thought I would uh, one up that. And we did a, a book called, because I was sort of more of an Anglophile than, the, than I am now. We called it Various Dwellings Described in a Comparative Manner. I thought that was heavy enough for an academic title of a book. And um, I freely borrowed on a little sketch that Stephen Steen Eiler Rasmussen did in one of his books, you know, that kind of gnome like planner that's so terrific. And uh, we did a series of 30 uh, dwellings uh, where we did a, a plan and a section, elevation, perspective, all at the same point. I can draw a little diagram of it later on if anybody's really interested. And they were all comparative. They were all on the same scale. And everybody sort of liked that. I went on and a couple years later, went around the United States. Somebody gave me a grant. And um, I went around to all the major cities in the United States. It was a, I think a 20th century fund sound like a movie. And um, I went to all these major cities with Ed Higby, who was an urban geographer, and I collected all the uh, planning documentation that they had available in these cities. And uh, on the way back came through St. Louis. And there I met Joe Passano, who was then dean of Washington University in St. Louis. And he had just gotten a hunk of money to do a book on St. Louis because it was some kind of anniversary or some, I don't know, 120 years or 67 years or something. And um, I said, that'd be terrific, Joe. We, we got friendly quickly. Uh, but do you know, nobody's going to think anything of it unless they know St. Louis. Can you understand that if it's the best book ever done on St. Louis, if you haven't been there, if you have no measure of that book, if you have no sense of the scale of any map, if you have no experience with any piece of information in that, in that book because you haven't been there, because you don't know how big any part of it is, because you don't... There's no way to touch anything in that book. All you can say is, gee, that's a beautiful book on St. Louis. But there's nothing that uh, you will understand from that. Some of this lecture for some of you is going to be slightly like an old record because we talked about some of these things this afternoon. I'll try to think of some new things. So we decided to do an atlas. It was a modest thing, my first atlas. And um, we proceeded to overdo it, as one would do with his first atlas. And it came out very fancy, enormously expensive, 100 bucks, um, called Urban Atlas, 20 American Cities. Should have been done as a small paperback. Um, but it was the first time that anybody has ever done maps of uh, cities, United States, major cities, where they made the legends the same and the scale the same. It's the first time you could see the relationship between 
the density of population, the population of one city relative to another. The first time you can see land use patterns one relative to another. Well, that might not warm the cockles of your heart, but if you ever want to know anything about American cities, and if you've ever been around and there's no way of understanding a city relative to your own, you don't understand anything about it. I mean, you've all gone to cities and you come in an airport and what happens? You don't know if you're northeast, southwest of the city. You don't know how to get downtown. You don't know what you're going to pass through as you get downtown. You don't know what different opportunities you have to come into town by different routes. You don't know what those routes cost. You don't know how long it's going to take. You are full of anxiety. And then when you get there, you don't know how much mileage you've passed through, where you are when you arrive, what's around you, how far the core is, how big it is, can you walk where you want to go, how do you find a restaurant, do you take a cab or is it around the corner and the cab's going to take you half around town to find your restaurant? We don't know nothing about the cities of America. You don't know anything about any place you've been before. You compound that by not being able to speak the language, and it's a real horror trip. But you're brave. And you come in and you go to new cities and you don't ever really say to yourself, I don't understand. You think you do. You fool yourself into thinking you do. And you don't demand that somebody make that understandable. Think of the collective anxiety of 200 million Americans traveling every year. Think if you could measure, if you could fill tubs with that anxiety, think how many tubs you'd have. It's terrible. We do it to ourselves. Well, so much for the passion. Well, so I thought I was going to do a little, um, taking off on what Charlie said, I thought I could do endless books, making things, just simply turning out dumb things, everything on the same scale, comparative, and that would be it. I had my whole academic career tied up. Because uh, obviously you could think of endless things that nobody had done, because nobody had done anything. Um, in a sense, that's one of the sub-themes of this whole talk. I mentioned it this afternoon, and that's the value of the dumb idea. The value of just thinking of something that you would just like to know and having enough courage and enough confidence to do it. And not to have somebody say, well, that's not so bright. That's a pretty dumb idea. But it's all the dumb ideas that nobody have done. I mean, that's the ones. They're all around us. You walk through them every day. You think of them, and then you cast them aside because they don't have the kind of right academic patina on them. But all the good ones are dumb. Uh, making maps the same scale. There's nothing really very deep about that. You can think that one up pretty easy. Uh, models is maybe a little harder. But uh, doing things to the same scale, making information relative to each other, that's not so clever. Well, another thing that we did which wasn't so clever is my partner and I, Al Levy, Alan G. Levy. I just want a little bit of dignity. That's why I went to Richard Soul Werman. I don't look so dignified, so I could use it at all. I mean, if you have a tape of this, you won't know how it looks. But... Um, Alan and I uh, did a book a number of years ago called Our Man Made Environment. And uh, it was done when we reflected that the uh, most of our experience has to do with things that are man-made. Obviously, every single thing you see in this room is man-made. Um, very few people have any reasonably high percentage of any of their experience that's the natural environment, what you call natural environment. A lot of people from the city think farmland is natural. I mean, they think they go out and they drive in the country and they see farms and this is all the natural environment. I mean, it's all man-made. I mean, farms, what could you think of that's more man-controlled, man-made? Um, this morning we had another big oil refinery fire in Philadelphia. And the sky was man-made. Um, most everything we see is. But most of us don't realize it is. Certainly kids don't understand that. Uh, they think, they take for granted, well, they think the man-made environment is all the buildings and everything else is natural. The parks are natural because they have trees in them. <clears throat> A lot of people think Central Park is natural. Of course, it's not natural at all. I assume you all know that. Um, in walks I've taken with kids, the shocking thing that, that always surprises me is they think all the streets are natural Sorry. or that they're God-given, that they're always just there. And it's people that come and build products, little shoebox on the other side of the street. That's the things you look at. But 
but the streets are always there after all. I mean, they've always been there. That's the pattern that exists. They never think that somebody put a dimension on that street. How many times did you think that the street could be four feet wider or four feet narrower? I mean, when's the last time you really questioned what the curve was? I mean, why do you have it and why is it that way? It could be another way. You accept all that stuff. That's bad for your head to accept all those things and not to question them. Not that you don't come back and do the same thing, but you at least ought to question them. You should go to zero on all the simplest, dumbest parts of your daily life. The street, the curb, a tree, a front step, everything that seems that you, should, that you take it for granted, that you get so used to, used to it that you don't question it. One of the things we were talking about at dinner tonight is a thing in, that you see in the papers all about schools and size of the classroom. And everybody here, I think, if we took a vote, would say that a smaller classroom is a better classroom. How do you know? I mean, smaller number of people in a classroom. How do you know it's better? You don't question it. You just assume it's better. Maybe you once had a nice experience with just a few people sitting around. How do you know it would be better to have 100 in a classroom? I don't know. Okay, the man, our man-made environment just has four questions in it. What is the man-made environment? Why do we build it? What determines its form and how do we change it? Those four questions are good for the most simple, basic course about the man-made environment. And if you had a graduate seminar in urban planning, you'd say, what is the man-made environment? What determines its form? Why do we build it? How do you change it? Same questions. Al Levy just finished a book called Process of Choice. It had four parts. The first question is, what do you want? The second one is, what are your resources? The third one is, what are you allowed to do? And the fourth one is, how do you make a choice? Well, it's written in very simple language, but that's what you should think about. This afternoon, in this afternoon's lecture, I put it to the group, and I can't answer the question either, but if I asked this group, if somebody would stand up and tell me what do they want, is there anybody here who would come up front now and tell me what do they want out of their physical environment from now on? Uh, what is it you want? Can you say, well, can you answer, what do you want? But that's what you expect everybody to tell you. If you have a client, you say, what do you want? Um, what is it that you want? I don't know what I want. Man, that's really hard. But if you don't think about what you want, and if you don't think of how hard it is to answer those dumb questions, and how hard it is to really do a book with the title, what do you want? I mean, that's really leading with your chin. Um, tonight's talk, I'm going to do three or four things. I'm national chairman of the AIA convention next year. It's going to be in Philadelphia. AIA conventions are really dull business. Um, people normally come, the people come to AIA conventions. Um, I've gone to several. I've always been so bored, I walk out of them. So it's strange that I'm doing it. And I'm doing it for very simple reasons. It's because by being in charge, I might be able to change it. And being in charge and in the city in which I live, I hope I can put together a real pile of things, a compendium of events that will elaborate, will become permutations on each other, elaborate this theme that I hold passionately close to my heart, which is making public information public about the physical environment. I think it's architectural. I think it's political. I think it's educational, I think it's fun, uh, and I know I don't know anything about the physical environment, so it helps me. I, uh, I don't understand anything I read virtually. I can't read hard books. I, uh, everybody reads these hard books. They say, did you read this book? It's terrific. I don't even, I can't get past page three. I have a hard time with hard books. I have a hard time with newspaper articles. And I think you people have a hard time with newspaper articles, and you don't let yourself know that. You don't admit that you don't understand a damn thing that you're reading in the paper. And you don't demand that anybody put anything in the paper so that you can't understand it. Or the magazines. Except wars. They do the good job on wars. Good job on wars, good jobs on trips to the moon, bad job on crime, bad job on education. Good job on scientific discoveries. Bad job on most everything that hits us every day. Really bad job. Take when you go home tonight, tomorrow morning, if you read a paper at all, take a headline in the front page. Besides a sporting event, which you know who wins or loses. Uh, take a, an article about 
the environment, read it, headline, and an article, read it, see if you can explain it to somebody sitting next to you. Just see if you can. You're going to be shocked. But there isn't enough information there to explain it and answer any questions about it. And if you wanted to find out about more about it, you wouldn't know how to find out about it. Oh, you think you do? Well, we'll go down to City Hall, we'll go down to the... You're not going to find out about it. Not because they're suppressing it, they don't know how about it either. It's very difficult. Information about how a city works, how it functions, about education, about learning, about the streets department, about the sewer system, about crime, is, is very difficult to put your hands on. People throw numbers at you, but you've read the numbers now lately. They just had this national crime thing that just been published. And the Philadelphia one was just incredible. It was, it was like crime was up. These are numbers I don't even remember, but the crime was up in Philadelphia, but it wasn't up as much as some other cities. And then they broke it down into different crime, you know, that certain, you know, rape was down, but murder was up, and this was down, and the other thing was up. There was nothing you could understand from that. It told you nothing that you could relate to, nothing you could do anything about, nothing that related the money being spent on safety, supposedly, on police per, per capita or so, nothing that said more police make it safer or more police make it worse or nothing about education making it better or worse, or nothing about more light or less light, nothing about what areas of the city the crime was up in, is it all, or, or whether there was more police in those areas or less. There's nothing you could do with that information, and you can't do anything about it nationally. You can't use it, except you can emotionally react to it. Well, I was trying to tell you what I was gonna talk about tonight. Uh, well, that's, I was telling you that I was running this, this convention, and I've been to a number of conventions, and I hate keynote speeches. It's just a thing. I have it on my back, and I really don't like keynote speeches because I've never heard a good one. I find it's very dull. And so I've decided that instead of a keynote, since I can design what was going to happen here for 4,000 people, you know, and have the party always want to have but couldn't, um, we're going to have a keynote fable. And uh, at the moment, Peter Ustinov is going to come and perform the fable. Uh, at least he said he would if he's not making a film. He won't know till January, so maybe there'll be somebody else. But he's my ideal for delivering the fable. And of course, I'm writing the fable. Um, I'm going to read you something. And this is something I never do, which is reading something. But I'm going to read you the first draft because I really desperately want to hear how it sounds to a group. It's the first draft of the fable. I don't think, if I find it's too long, I'll just stop at a certain point. But I'll get into it a little bit, and this is going to be, in a sense, the theme of the convention. Here we go. The working title is Everything You Wanted to Know About the Physical Environment and Weren't Afraid to Ask But Couldn't Find Out About Anyway. The settlement looks familiar. Close across a band of water in the land of what-if, in the city of could-be, in the place occupied by the highest appointed official of the land, since the commissioner of curiosity and imagination. And here we begin our story. Appointed by the unanimous vote of those who care, the commissioner was charged in the year 200, 200 to celebrate the future. It had been 200 years since a ringing event that was considered an especially appropriate time. Throughout the months of the celebration, the commissioner decreed many important acts. Now he is remembered for his first and most dramatic statement. In fact, many scholars feel that all of his later and more elaborate proclamations are but permutations of that very first act. In the fourth day of the seventh month in that 200th year, he wrote the public information should be made public act. The city fathers of could be immediately responded with the creation of an urban observatory. Never had information about the city's formation, situation, and aspirations been available for both resident and visitor alike in an understandable format. Techniques that had been previously reserved by the news media for the intricacies of wars and travel to and from the moon, such as simulation movies and illustrative bird's eye maps, were finally applied to the fundamentals of daily urban life. Not only was public information made public, but also ideas. It turned out that every good idea was in essence a public idea. No individual could own a, good idea, could own a public idea, so the laws of copyright were changed to the right to copy. The sides of buses which once talked pizza pie and funeral parlors now began to, began to advertise where they were going, their routes and points of interest near where they stopped. Factories replaced some of their walls with windows so that passersby could observe the manufacturing process. 
Some even made exhibits on the street which described their products, what they were made from, and how they were made, and most importantly, why they were made the way they were made. The lobbies of apartment houses and office buildings became active places with information services related to and reflecting the activities taking place in the building above. With so much activity taking place in building lobbies, people soon began to realize how incredibly wasteful it had been not to use them before. In the parks and playgrounds, trees were labeled with their names and information about their species. Closed circuit television systems brought news events and public service broadcasts into the subway stations. Waiting took on new meaning with the crea creation of the Weight Watchers program. <laughs> the entrances to the city, the airports, train and bus stations, and major highways were treated as if they really were gateways after all, and introduced visitors to could be with a warm handshake of helpful information. Soon could beans everywhere began to tell each other what and why they were doing whatever they were doing, where they were doing it. It was career education's finest hour. Yet while all this sounds very exciting to us, it was not at first a complete success among the entire citizenry. Certain groups complained to the commissioner and expressed their dissatisfaction. Museum directors, noting a drop in attendance at museums, complained that the public environment was becoming too interesting and was hurting the museum business. Teachers objected because more students were playing hooky from school, even though the teachers did admit to an intensified quest for learning when the students returned to school. How can we run the school program properly with so much learning going on the streets, they asked. Architects and designers, however, immediately stopped doing presentation drawings, concentrating on the look of buildings, and began to do communication drawings focusing on how physical spaces would feel and perform. Good old architects. One month after his first proclamation, the commissioner startled Kudbeans by releasing an incisive report, an analysis that confirmed what only a certain few people had known all along. This study observed that our ability to affect change in the physical environment had been entirely limited to the use of only two words, no and more. During the preceding 10 years, legitimacy had been achieved for the concept of the public's right to stop things. It didn't always work. Roads, housing, wars, babies, smoking, eating, drinking, busing were marched against, voted against, lobbied against, and demonstrated against. Old and young, hippie and tycoon, hard hat and liberal alike embraced the right to say no. No was no longer a no-no. No had become half the planning process. When services that were expected to work didn't, when the products in the urban environment didn't perform, everybody immediately asked for more of what had failed to work, as if more would make them work when less had not. More thus had become the other half of the planning process. So no, they cried an answer to some things and more to others. When the schools didn't seem to work, the PTA paraded for more schools. As crime became worse, there was a demand for more police and longer prison sentences. More roads when traffic was heavy, more signs when people double parked, more parking lots for the increasing numbers of slumbering cars. No or more instead of the articulation of people's needs. More light poles could always be ordered, whereas the critical problem really had to do with the quality of lighting, not just a greater quantity of light poles. Performance versus more products. Lighting versus more light poles. Learning versus more schools. Safety versus more police. Mobility versus more roads. Communication versus more signs. Comfort versus more street furniture. Recreation versus more parks. In every case, it was found that our cities were being designed from massive catalogs filled with an accumulation of products that, for the most part, had only proved their incapability to solve a single performance. This realization gave rise to the Product Performance Act. Could beings now realize that they wanted better lighting, not prettier lamp poles? They wanted more effective opportunities for recreation, not simply more parks. They needed learning, and, uh, efficient options for movement, better health care, not simply more schools, more cars, more parking lots and highways, and more hospitals. The city of Kudby was actually working better as well as looking better. Sign ordinances became more permissive, allowing signs of any signs, but size, but urging that all signs use white light on Main Street, red on another, white and blue on another. The city at night became a life-size route map. The avenues that led to the major parks were green, and those to the river were resplendent with blue light. At night, the city was instantly understood. The public buildings were bathed in light. The monotony of overhead light poles emitting a science fiction yellow-green glow was replaced by individual shopkeepers lighting their shop windows and adjacent sidewalks. Along the curb, a band of light softly washed the streets and the sidewalks, creating light where it mattered, instead of the roofs of cars and the tops of people's heads. Light had become a kinetic sculpture, creating the image of the street and of the city. The basic understanding premise 
entitled, You Only Understand Something Relative to Something You Understand, was next announced, followed by a provocative cover story by the Best Read News Weekly, which substantiated that there had not been an information overload as had been thought all along, but rather a non-information overload. In a conversation with the commissioner's associate in charge of future meetings, it was decided to suggest the renaming of certain operative desires, values, and programs. Being changed to becoming. Absolute to relative. Parts to whole. Extremes to balance. Quantity to quality. And present became future. Programs were established based on pro-health rather than anti-disease, life rather than death, birth control instead of death control, self-expression instead of self-repression, and self-restraint rather than external restraint. The focus and professional interest of young people ought to be to learn about learning. Learning about learning was not to be found in the course description or curriculum of any high school, junior high school, or grammar school in the entire country of what if. Learning about learning is the process that necessarily must precede learning about French, English literature, or chemistry. Once people relaxed and perceived learning as an occupation in itself, rather, to, rather than the accumulation, retention, and regurgitation of data, they recognized the young as the professionals of learning about learning they must become. Many schools developed curriculum approaches which did not need to be enclosed within their walls. Classes began utilizing the new learning resources available in the streets of could be, and the new Board of Learning acknowledged after conducting evaluation studies that people learn best when they can relate what they desire to learn to things they already understand. The three R's were then replaced by the three P's, people, places, and processes, which you can learn from a person, at a place, and about a process. This turned out to be the only subject of equal interest to teachers, students, and parents alike. It was the world of work revealed. Even those schools which remained traditional in their operations made their school buildings themselves objects for learning. Blueprints of the school were framed and hung in the hallways, and means were devised to make transparent what happened when the toilets were flushed, how electricity was distributed throughout the school, how people used spaces, how the arrangement of furniture affected how interaction among people was affected, how the building was heated, even how the roof and the walls were supported structurally. The entire schoolhouse became a laboratory for learning. There seemed to be something more you could learn from your schoolhouse. It was found that the time between classes was at least, if not more important, than the time sitting in a classroom. The commissioner passed the 60-60 Act, which allowed for 60 minutes in class and 60 minutes between classes. The corridor, the largest single area of space in any schoolhouse, became the place of conversation and real learning it had always tried to be. The spin-off between the 60-60 Act and the working world has yet to be determined. Soon the museum directors and librarians, half admitting that their institutions were a bit more stodgy than they ought to be, decided to join the tide rather than fight it. They moved their institutions out into the city and utilized the ground floor of could be itself for display and exhibition. Both the libraries and the museums began to realize that they wanted to become participatories instead of the repositories they had traditionally been. With the increased demands for appropriate space utilization, land use by level came into being. The Let's Do Our Level Best Act was passed requiring that anybody given the privilege of constructing a tall building also had the obligation of providing the tops of buildings for public use and the ground floor for public interest. If they're good enough for cocktail lounges and executive offices, how much better for public observatories and learning places, de declared the commissioner. Each new building project became a news event. They were not only reviewed, pictured, and discussed, but their owners were rewarded instead of being penalized with tax concessions based on how well they served the public's comfort, safety, and informational needs. For many years, building owners had been taxed heavily when they improved their properties, so many hadn't bothered. The city of Kudby had been encouraging deterioration rather than improvement. The metropolis had been masochistic, causing slums by legislation and loopholes. It finally occurred to somebody that people should be able to walk around the city when it was raining and not get wet. The Dry Look Act was formulated when it was found that by allowing the second floors and above to come out to the curb line, it automatically created marvelous covered walkways by buildings. This could be done only on the west and south facades, so that walking under shade and under cover was always an option. Because this arcade increased the general level of meeting, greeting, and exchange of thoughts, it became known as the city university to some, and simply the bridge to others. Upon the discovery that the leading repository of taste, the Museum of Modern Artifacts, had shell fills with items that looked good but didn't work. A new edict called Taste Makes Waste was conceived. The commissioner looked into the operation of this and other museums. He discovered that certain institutions devoted entire departments to the creation of taste. In their desire to discover trends in art before their competition, uniqueness had become a value in itself. 
Chairs were exhibited that were uncomfortable. Elegant orange juice squeezers that were underpowered but so beautiful. Beauty, it turned out, couldn't squeeze oranges or support bottoms. This concern with the integration of beauty with the facts of the performance of each object led the Museum of Modern, Modern Artifacts name to be changed to the Museum of Modern Art and Facts. It turned out that the facts were of great interest with the result that the public not only visited in greater numbers, but clamored for increased involvements with the nature and appropriateness of the displays and their general use in learning about man-made objects in the man-made environment. The commissioner, in his wisdom, chose to engender the real sense of public ownership of the city. He announced the city over two, half the city belongs to you act by publishing of the public environment map, a simple land use map showing that fully half of the city was publicly owned or regulated. Henceforth, all this area was called public property, as it had always been called. Just a side note, really, you probably don't know this, but half of the land in every American city is publicly owned, or public real estate, I mean, 50%. In their desire to train persons to be able to describe visually the information they found newly available, art teachers began to realize that art as, as, as <clears throat> art teachers began to realize that art, as they had taught it, hadn't any discipline. In fact, people had apparently so, thought so little of it as a subject that it was unique in everybody's studies, having no rules or goals. In the most progressive schools, it consisted of free play. In the most repressive, art was free play, but you couldn't leave your seats. You think about that. Soon, as with every other subject, art classes began to teach grammar, discipline, and rules. To be sure, there were some differences. It was a visual grammar, and the discipline and rules were directed towards their success, measured by the communication and understandability of information. The subject for visual communications was the immediate physical environment. For example, students learned to communicate such things as the experience of navigating their neighborhood and the characteristics of their community, the qualities and quantities of the world around them. Art, it turned out, was of immense value to the description and understanding of the spirit in math, physics, biology, and history. Art was recognized as a complementary and equally important language as words and numbers, and it immediately became part of the college entrance examinations. Even television found it rewarding to rise to the competition, developing new techniques for two-way communication between viewers and stations. Public opinion polls were conducted routinely, and feedback became an important part of many broadcasts. People soon found feedback was even more exciting than instant playback. Well, I'll skip a little bit here. A program was begun using movie theaters during their slack morning hours for the information displays and as neighborhood nodes of the urban observatory. Certain theaters were then programmed for a year-long continuous information film festival called Sin City. That's C-I-N-E. The ideas of a film festival in the heart of the city had great appeal. This act was only the first of many that focused attention on the vast amounts of underutilized prime space that existed throughout the city waiting to be wanted. This, of course, became the name of a new city agency when the Department of Waiting to be Wanted was formed <clears throat> and run by senior citizens. This one's for Charlie. Toilets and telephones, resting places and refreshing places, comfortable, dry, safe, and informative places to wait for transportation were all provided with a conspicuous lack of fanfare. In fact, it was with embarrassment that these services now only found their way into the society, into a society which was able to automat, automate six car windows from the driver's seat and otherwise over provide for so many things. Six car windows, Mr. Charlie. Don't you have all your windows? How many windows can you order? Six. I thought it had The leading architectural magazines decided to drop their superficial feature called Building of the Month that only looked at the look of things and began to concentrate instead on the month of buildings that analyzed what was built and how well it served the occupants and the public. Architectural stylists went out of style. Oh, this is a funny one. The commissioner, in an off mood, created a parlor game on a dare satirizing rules, regulations, and variances. Called Zone and Moan, the object was to construct strange and inappropriate buildings by finding loopholes in different zoning ordinances. The game was a failure. It pro proved no challenge whatsoever. Ordinance after ordinance let the players put together the worst results easily. Ziggurats, wedding cakes, squat square turds, setbacks, toothless grins, and parking lots passed off as open space. The shape of things to come and zero zoning were two other tries at gamesmanship by the commissioner, which along with zone and moan were to be found at a minor display at the Museum of Failure, but more about that later. 
Perhaps the most radical proposal the commissioner announced that year was the elimination of all zoning of private property. The commissioner decided to send his, instead to zone all the streets and the sidewalks. It was the streets and sidewalks, after all, that, that determined the physical structure of the city, the extent and nature of all its services, and potential for access to all the property that abutted them, which, of course, was all the property. The streets alone are zoned act and instantly was the clearest, fairest, and constructively the strongest planning legislation ever conceived. The label street furniture was abolished by the commissioner as a reaction to the fact that what was needed was places to sit, places to rest, places for orientation and communication, and what the city was buying was elaborate fiberglass molded souped up projects grouped like bunny turrets all over the place when low walls, arcades, and indigenous parts of buildings and the landscape would have worked much better. It wasn't additional furniture that was needed. It became urban Edsel time, city mascara week, and the desire for places to rest and refresh Designers stamped out a profusion of items fighting with each other to be the most styled. With the passage of the Junk, Bunk, and Trash Act, the commissioner pleaded with all the urban Elizabeth Ardens to restrain their vacuum-forming impulses and provide for people without the additional clutter of unnecessary objects. Pop art and pop architecture were soon abandoned and became simply the names of two new children's serials. The Commissioner of Curiosity and Imagination that year established only one new museum. This was the Museum of Failure, established in response to the public's inability to discuss and appreciate the value of failure. An overnight success, the museum's description of 200 years of personal and inventive failure caused an immediate reduction of 76% of all reported cases of mental disturbance and psychiatric visits. What was extraordinary was the success of failure and the recognition that so much useful activity formulations of meaningful ideas and conceptual breakthroughs had come from the strange embrace that the creative person has as he encounters the experience of failure and senses his reaction to it. The success of failure brought about an unprecedented flurry, perhaps one could say a renaissance, of artistic and inventive production. People, it turned out, had failed in different ways all along. They just didn't talk about it. Once people realized they didn't have to impress each other with boundless back-to-back -back success stories, the cocktail party as a form of social entertainment quickly disappeared. Failure became thought of as delayed success. In his desire to get things done, the commissioner passed the Patience is Not a Virtue Act, which established laissez-faire as a misdemeanor, punishable by a day of having to do something. It was realized that decision-making, which for years had been thought to operate best when reduced to a binary choice, yes or no, on or off, left or right, had developed a third and increasingly dominant alternative. Instead of doing this or doing that, more and more people were doing nothing. The commissioner of I Didn't Know That made an offhand comment that the subway system, with all its potential for fast and efficient movement, was actually a human sewer. The shock value of that image cannot be emphasized enough. It was soon analyzed and was found that the subway system was the most densely used piece of real estate in the entire region by a large factor. The injustice of allowing the most used places to be the worst places had enormous impact. Soon density and usage maps were demanded of all public places in order to assess priorities for improvement. As a result, the commissioner of curiosity and imagination, remembering his own rags to riches career, passed the From Sewers to Splendor Act aimed at all public places in need of becoming what they were meant to be all along. Borrowing from the neighboring city of Wasgood came an idea that the commissioner gave new meaning. He took the concept that 1% of the cost of public construction must be allocated for an applique of works of art. I don't know if you people are familiar with that. There's a number of cities that have a 1% rule. Uh, on all, all public buildings, 1% of the total construction cost has to be for art. He then changed it from 1% to 100%. He reasoned that the total budget for any public construction should be artfully executed, not just a legislated small percentage. The commissioner, to make his point, had scale models constructed of notable buildings with 1% art. Some, like the Golden Gate Bridge and the pyramids and the Eiffel Tower, look ridiculous with an unnecessary coating of sculpture. And others, like Milan's La Scala and Philadelphia City Hall, look bare. A building, a bridge, or a person can't be legislated into beauty. Percentage measurements were okay for batting average and interest rates, but had no place in creative construction or as a legal determination of aesthetic quality or even to ensure minimum mediocrity. The commissioner then went on to say, an artfully conceived environment 
thinks of the use of art fully. The Art Fully program led to a parallel program called Wonder Fully, which will be a subject of a later fable. The commissioner speaking, it's getting near the end. The commissioner speaking on the occasion of his sixth address spoke to a group made up of all the people with the best ideas, who by current standards were not at all successful. Repeated the old adage that in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man would be in the zoo. One person in the audience commented that you would then have to pay admission as you left the zoo. So we find it was discovered that properly designed, properly explained, the physical environment was the ultimate learning device revealing people to themselves. The invisible city had become visible, it had become the schoolhouse it had always been, the richest vehicle for learning that had ever been conceived. This laboratory for learning had a faculty made up of the entire population and classrooms with windows looking at what and why everybody was doing what they did and where they were doing it. With the coming of the end of the 200th year, we once again begin this story. A series of self-defeating programs that occurred prior to the year of Celebration 200. In the desire for taxes, we had encouraged the deterioration of buildings by taxing improvements. In the desire for places to park cars, open space had become parking lots, and over one-third of the cities, once designed for, designed for people, became designated for the automobile. In the desire to be clear, we had produced an overprofusion of confusing signs. In the desire for mobility, we had permanently scarred the land with highways ever too narrow for the increase in traffic they encouraged. In the desire for newness and progress, we had destroyed the marvelous spaces and places of the past. In the desire to be fair, we had created taxes with artificial loopholes that called for shoddy construction, lasting only the 20-year write-off life of a project. In the desire to escape fear, we had created a bureaucracy of restraint answerable only to itself. In the desire for plazas, we had rewarding buildings that destroyed the continuity of the street. In the desire for tranquility, there was produced a series of unnecessary objects that emitted a series of unnecessary noises. In the desire to look good, the concern for being good was ignored. In the desire to win, we had lost. The commissioner's last declaration in that 200th year was prophetic. He announced what will be has always been. This reflected the fact that everything he had enacted had been stated before, only nobody had heard. Everything that had been done before, but nobody had seen it. And that all had been of such uncommonly common sense that it didn't make sense to people who had become insensitive. The commissioner had released ideas and information that had been there all the time. He hadn't created anything but the ability for all to see the things they always see, but never see. The commissioner had celebrated the future while his peers were celebrating the past. He allowed them to see that the future is continuously happening, and so made them aware that they can continuously and constructively change it. The commissioner, the most senior of citizens, appeared to be the youngest person living in could be. Constructive demands for change to the way our cities work are not to be measured by the quantity of new products or by their look, but rather by their performance. Making public information public was not a new program that needed a new budget, but simply could be completely accomplished by a simple change in attitude. The collective change in attitude that occurred in the 200th year transformed fear to the feeling of safety, the alienation of schooling to the desire for learning, politics to participation, power to persuasion, and finally diffidence change to confidence as a result of genuine understanding. And the citizens of could be, in the land of what if, lived happily ever after. What if you cared could be your city too? That's the end. Are you clapping hard so you want me to stop? What time is it? Did I talk long then? How long was that? Huh? When do we start? There's so many things I want to say. Um, well, this is exactly what Charlie didn't want me to do. Um, but let's uh, take a five-minute break. And those who would like to hear more, because I really had a lot of other things I wanted to get into. If you'd like to hear more, 
I was going to do a show and tell on these, on some books. I'll tell you what I'm going to do if you want to hear it. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Um, I have a, a whole little story about career education, which I've just recently gotten into. And uh, the first 12 of the first 100 books are finished, and I'd like to tell you about that and why it's interesting for an architect to do it, and what it means to architecture, and what it means to making the environment understandable. Got one guidebook here, but I don't have to talk about that very much. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the AIA convention and what I'm going to try to do there and how that relates to architecture. And then as an extra thing, which we might not get to, I have I've taken one little part. One of the books I've done is called Making the City Observable. And in, in that little booklet, I collected about 80 ways of making information understandable about the physical environment. Most of those are visual, but not all of them. That was produced about four years ago. It went out of print oh, about two months after it came out. It's been out of print ever since. But since that time, instead of 80 things, I've collected 800 things. And I'm doing a new book called The Architecture of Information, which has all these things in an orderly way. The first one looks kind of lousy when I look at it now. But this one is really highly organized into, I think, 12 chapters. And there's really going to be a primer on making information understandable about the physical environment. In order to illustrate that book, I've taken one example out of the book, which is the subway map. And I have, I think, about I have two, two, two uh, projectors and about 20-some slides just on taking one little teeny piece of that book, just so you can understand what the whole field is and why there's such an opportunity to get into making information understandable about the physical environment, which nobody's doing. And uh, so this explains the kind of history of the subway map. Some examples from New York, Philadelphia, some other cities. Paris, London. Ooh, I'm stepping on somebody's book. I stepped on your book and I'm sorry. So let's take a five minute break. I'll come back. I'll talk for about 10, 15 minutes on the environmental education, career education, and the AIA convention. Then I'll take another two minute break while we turn off the lights and I'll show some slides if there's people who want to see it. You don't offend me at all by leaving. I appreciate you as an audience and thank you. Five minutes and we'll be back. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin the second half of the lecture tonight by Richard Saul Werman. Hear me better. Good. I'd like to tell you very quickly about some disparate, seemingly disparate interests, which for me are all the same thing. I don't look at anything I'm di doing as being different than, uh, than architecture. I am an architect. I spend 85, 90% of my time on architecture, designing buildings, working on urban planning things, working on projects like that in my office. Most of what I'm telling you about tonight is a series of elaborate hobbies, whether it's running a convention, or whether it's doing a book, or whether it's career education, or things like that. Um, I like them, but I like everything else I'm doing, too, equally. And I'm not always trying to ferret out time from my architectural practice so I can really, you know, write the great American novel. Uh, I'm not trying to ferret time at all. I have a lot of time. It's my only commodity. Um, I have plenty of time to do anything. That doesn't seem to be my problem. I have a lot of other problems. Um, just for the record, we have a small office, including secretaries, partners, everything. There's 11 of us. We're in an old loft space that used to sell wholesale underwear. Um, it's sort of in the uh, district and town that's heavily populated with priests, Cossacks, and nuns, finery, and porno shops. It's a very strange com combination, but that's what's there. Um, we've been in business about 11 years. And we've yet to have a successful year in most people's terms. It's sort of a marginal office, but we still stick around. So it seems like we'll be around a little bit more. Um, and we do everything from houses to a terrific thing we're doing now, which is the public improvements, some massive public improvements on the waterfront called Penn's Landing. We're remodeling the courtyard of City Hall, which is right in the center city. A bunch of different things, which is kind of nice doing a lot of different things. Uh, I uh, discovered that although we did some books, a uh, number of books, that sold reasonably well, I was 
have been uh, assured by the way they sold and where they sold that the only people who bought them is the people who wanted to buy them. And what I mean by that is I don't think we made any converts. Uh, the people who bought our man-made environment or process of choice or learning to get around or guidebook to guidebooks or man-made Philadelphia or Urban Atlas or various dwellings described in a comparative manner or any of those books were people who were already motivated to buy those books. And that disappointed me because I have certain proselytizing nature uh, in my body. I'm very interested in power, the kind of power of ideas. I don't look at power as a no-no. I look at it as a very positive, embraceable thing. And that's, in a sense, why I'm doing the AIA convention, for the power that it affords me. I mean, where do I get the opportunity to design a week for 4,000 people and have things happen and see if they work or see if they don't work? It's an excuse to get some things done I've always wanted to get done. It's simply that. I hope the things I'm doing are positive and there's enough checks and balances that would stop them if, if I'm being foolhardy. I mean, embarrassment on my part and a lot of the people I work with. So I wanted some of the ideas that I had to get to other people and I looked into uh, what was legitimate. And the only thing legitimate in the school system, legitimate in the sense that everybody loved it, what I mean by that is kids, teachers, and parents, rare, was the idea of what people did. Career education, world of work. So I think kid, kids are really interested. I mean, people are, I mean, I would say some people here are interested in what people do. Uh, uh, very soon, you're going to have to find out what people do. Uh, in high school, there's a very big decision time to figure out what you're going to do and what do people do. And you can't find out about it. Mothers and fathers have big guilt because they can't tell their kids what people do. Think of the guilt your parents have. How many kids here do not have parents who are architects? It's hard for them to tell you what an architecture is like. There must be some pro problems you have in talking with them and having them understand why you spend so long cutting and pasting. I mean, why would you do that? You're, 19 years old and you're cutting and pacing with super balls, right? I mean, why would you do that? Well, what people do is really of great interest. It fascinates me. It always has for my whole life. Love to go to factories. Just, just love to see how things work. The material that's available in the school system today is just a joke. It comes in four packages. Uh, it comes in little packages where there's a book, a little skinny little book, uh, written by Nancy Nurse on nursing. And it tells you how wonderful nursing is. It's just a just terrific thing, and it's, it's just what you should do. And uh, then there's the great big book on engineering that you find in the library, and it's more than you ever want to know in your whole life about engineering. And you don't want to take it out of the library. You don't want to commit yourself. You don't want to carry it home. And you're not going to open it if you take it home. You flash through, you see a picture, and, <laughs> Behind the counselor's desk are two big volumes with 33,000 careers in them that she has and she holds because that's her only claim to information. <laughs> Everything she knows is in those two books and she doesn't even know what's in those two books and they're out of date and they don't really have the accurate information anyway. And then there are the films mediocre at best, horrible little films that cost a fortune. School people buy them in droves, because after all, when a film's on, a teacher doesn't have to work. And uh, that's career education. It is just horrific, just terrific. So I thought, being that there was a good vacuum there, I would try to produce something that I thought was okay. And um, that's this Yellow Pages Career Library, which I have a bunch of things here that people have been pulling through. And I think it's architecture, because what I am planning to do is to find out what everybody does. And it's only by me understanding and you understanding and everybody understanding the three Ps, people, places, and processes. What is a process? What is a place? What is a person? What you can learn from a person at a place and about a process. The three Ps instead of the three Rs, if you remember from the fable. And this was a book I did for the, con I, I ran uh, the International Design Conference in Aspen a few years ago. The name of the conference was The Invisible City, and this is a little booklet I did just because it gave me an excuse to do a booklet because I was running a convention. I did it to give away to everybody who came, and it was said, the, the resources of a city are its people, places, and processes. 
we've printed a couple thousand to give away, and there was such a demand for it, we've sold 150,000 copies of this since then. That's a lot of books when it, you've probably never seen it, anybody here, but it's been, it hasn't been advertised or anything, it's just sort of teachers picking them up. The slides yet. And so based on that, we're gonna do 300 books eventually. 100 on 100 processes, 100 on 100 places, and 100 on 100 people. So by doing career education, we're really doing environmental education which you can learn about how things operate in the city. I've learned a tremendous amount doing these first 12. I mean, I didn't know what anybody does. You think you know what a carpenter does. You don't know what a carpenter does. Um, one thing we did here, which is also in something more you can learn from your schoolhouse, is the center pages show, have a photograph of four real people taken every half an hour during the day. So it shows what people do. I'm telling you this not because I expect you all to go into career education or do books on career education, but everything I'm telling you about of how to look at a problem simply is applicable to how do you communicate information about anything you're working on. How does one of your buildings work? How would you think it should work? How could you describe what your building is like every half an hour during the day? What is it to be like in a building? Does the people in your building stay in one room for eight hours? Do they circulate around the building? How do you think about the things you're making and how can you communicate those things so that other people understand. And I hope I don't have to, in each thing I'm telling you, make that connection for you. But obviously everything I'm saying about any book I'm talking to you about, there's a connection to what you're doing. It's not different, it's the same. You have to embrace the dumbest look you can take at life. And embrace the fact that a simple decision that works for one thing works for you. Steal it. Take anything that's worthwhile taking. Forget about copyright. Really, it's you have a right to copy. You have a right to copy anything that's valuable for, for you. Do it. Don't feel guilty about it. It's terrific to do that. I mean, it's just as good. I'm in a lot of meetings, and sometimes people think I dominate some meetings, and that all the ideas are mine. Oh, 5% maybe are mine. If I hear a good idea, I jump on it. I don't claim it as my own, but I say, yeah, that's terrific. I've become its champion. Because if you can recognize a good idea, that's all it's about. What you want to do is produce something good. You want to be involved in good decisions, not protective of your own idea, and sit back with your thumb in your navel and say, oh, it's his idea, I can't work on it. I have high hopes. By the way, just pass these around. I'd love to get all 12 back because I'm going to give them to the school. So please just pass them around. People want to look at them. They are done purposely very simple. There's no flashy, slick graphics in those because the idea is not to threaten, I'm going to answer your question, not to threaten anybody by a fancy format or uh, high panache, if that's the right word. And just to have some, there's a squib on the middle of the back page, which is fun to read. Uh, you might want to read that. It's the same in all of them. Availability. We did these uh, books out of pocket because sometimes it takes more time to find somebody to help you with money than to just do it yourself. I mean, there's a kind of point of no return uh, where by the time you find $10,000 to do something, you've spent $10,000 of your time trying to find it, and then you get the $10,000, and then you don't want to do it anymore. Right? This costs considerably more than $10,000 to do these 12, uh, but we just decided to gamble and, and, and do it. We, I got a group in Washington, Arlington actually, to distribute enough to put out a mailer to teachers and distribute enough so because I had to get back the printing bill. I didn't have that extra 25 grand to uh, pay out. We haven't gotten anything back on our development costs. I have an entrepreneur type out there trying to negotiate with a couple big companies because that's what it takes. It takes a considerable amount of money to do 100 of these. You know, we're talking about a lot of money. I mean, more than, you know, you spent on, you know, ice cream last week. Um, and more than you could get from a grant. And more than you can get from a publisher. It has to be some company who will really front end it because they think it really is a valuable resource. If that comes through, which I hope before the end of the year, then we'll probably get money to do it immediately another 24, so I'm making 36 out, and uh, these will be going to reprinting and there'll be a big national distribution. If I fail at that, which I do with so many things, it might be another six months or so before I line up somebody else in a different manner. My every desire is to get them out and to really make sure they get around. Now the only way you can get them is through these people in Washington, National Association of Elementary School Principals. It's written in the front of it, and you can get it from them. They're, uh, I don't know if they're expensive to you or not, they, they come in a box, and there are 12 of them for 25 bucks. The schools don't seem to mind, that seems like a good bit of money, but that's what we're told they should sell for. Um, 
Oh, this is fun. You have to do. Oh, just passed all these things around. This was a book. This this shiny green book is um, a book called The Nature of Recreation. And I spoke a little bit about this this afternoon. And it comes from that part of the talk, that part of the fable, in which I talked about the difference between a product and a performance. This whole book is trying to describe in enough detail so that somebody can ask for places for recreation, performance of recreation, rather than just a preconceived part. It took me a whole book to do that. I hope I can do it simpler next time I try another one of those slots. But theoretically, you should have a whole book on this on safety, on mobility, on learning. I mean, if you could do a book that could help people see that, give, give people a way of making constructive demands about a performance rather than asking for a preconceived product. Instead of just asking for a school, ask for learning. Might not turn out to be a school. Uh, instead of asking for policemen, ask for safety. It might not turn out to be safe, police and, and, and police cars. It might turn out to be a group of things. As a civilization, we have no ability to ask for anything but the preconceived product. We don't, I don't. It's very, very difficult. I'm not trying to be glib by saying we should all walk, run out in the street and ask for learning. I don't have to do it either. It's very hard, but you have to see the value of it. You have to see the value that if I had five light poles in the front of the room and we each voted for which light pole we liked the best, we could do that. And that's the way they're picked. But if I asked any one of you to stand up in front of the room and tell me what is the quality of artificial illumination you like to have at the city? And what is that quality of lighting? What is the lighting you want? Not just the light pole, but what is the quality of lighting you want in a city and in different parts of a city? Could you get up in front and talk about that? That's really hard. It's hard for architects to do. It's hard for students to do. The uh, streets department can't do it. So it's not easy to do, but you have to see that just picking light poles out is not what you're meant to be. I mean, if you think you're going to school to be able to pick out a light pole, then that's really, that's really terrible. Now, most architects and most designers do pick their things from products. I think it's open for question. So that's what that book is about. This is just a guidebook to Philadelphia called Man-Made Philadelphia. It's pretty. This is a book called Our Man-Made Environment, which I talked about briefly. I don't have the book called Process of Choice, which I should have brought and I didn't. And here's two more career bar. We have social worker and nurse here. He wants, he wants the nurse. <laughs> I talked a little bit about running a convention today. I don't know how to run a convention, and I don't know anybody who knows how to run a convention. There's no model for it, and most of them are failures. There's little parts of different ones that are sort of fun or that make sense, or where you were able to meet somebody and talk to somebody you wouldn't have met or talked to except by that excuse of that gathering. That seems to be a good thing. There's sometimes, if a, if a conference has a clear enough backbone, there maybe is, the theme of it is defined. There's no heavy information passed at a convention, remember that. But if you can define the theme, at least make the theme understandable, you've done a hell of a lot for whoever comes. Just defining a theme is a big deal. Defining anything so people understand is a big deal. I ran at the Aspen conference three years ago, or four years ago, called the Invisible City, and that was a really good phrase because it had, it was all full of questions that people automatically asked themselves as to what it meant. Uh, what is the invisible city? Is the, in the city invisible to us? What happens if the invisible city becomes visible and becomes a place that you can learn from? The AI convention is not a hell of a lot different than that as far as theme, but the execution of it is considerably different. First of all, it's for a very particular group, uh, architects, whereas uh, Aspen is for uh, a very general group. It's in a city instead of in, in Aspen. The place you're having it makes it quite different. And it has the stodgy uh, reputation and kind of line items that you pull over from the year before that one has to try to overcome, obliterate, or um, massively deny. The um, AIA convention is called an American City. It's a title I came up with over a year ago 
it was to mean all things to all people and to be able to get me the most amount of cooperation from people outside the profession as possible because in American City nobody can be against it. And so that's the official theme. The secondary theme is called the architecture of information. And what I'm going to try to do, as was in the fable there, all the ideas in the fable I'm going to try to do. The fable is about the convention. Sin City is a program. I'm negotiating with seven movie theaters on Chestnut Street, which has just been closed to have an urban communications film festival on Chestnut Street in the heart of the, the city. Uh, let's do our level best act. We have an, a program called Tops of Tall, where we're trying to get the tops of 10 buildings for public access so you can see the city. We have a resource store. We have, I forget what else is in the fable. All the things in the fable is the convention. That's what the fable is about what we're going to try to do during the convention week. Um, we're going to have a lot of very good speakers, I believe, but they're all going to be small seminars, much smaller than this, hopefully no more than maybe 25 or 30 people, so you can sit around the table and talk to people. There really can be an interchange. And we're having none of it in hotels. We're having it all in bank boardrooms, meeting rooms, bank lobbies, architect's offices, immediately adjacent to Chestnut Street, which is closed for 10 blocks. So we're trying to have it out in the city and not in the Sheraton Hotel. Can you imagine picking that hotel as a headquarters? Sure. It's really, really something else. Mm. My economy. I was going to say something, but I thought it would offend everybody when I was going to describe it. Sure. No, no, I couldn't do it. Once you think about it, you know you shouldn't say it. Um, Well, I can talk for a long time about that. Is there any questions about that? I'm going to try to pass over some things lightly. So if you want to ask me any questions about things, you can either later or write to me. Anything more about that? Yes, sir. From whom? Well, if I didn't think it would be a very good response, I wouldn't do it. Um, I have no death wish. Um, no, I mean, I don't, I don't like, I mean, I've always defined running a, a convention as a public way of failing. Uh, there'll be some of that, sure. No, I, I would hope that, every, that not everybody likes everything, but there'll be things that people enjoy. Um, I really hope that the theme gets communicated, that there are many, many ways of making information understandable about the physical environment, that it's part of our responsibility that we should make constructive demands to make things understandable, and that we as a profession, as well as everybody else, has failed to do that. And hopefully by example, by a keynote fable, by meeting, every person that comes to the convention is gonna be met at, the, at their, remember I talked about airports. Every person who comes to the convention is gonna be met at the airport personally, and at the train station, personally, and taken to their hotel. I, I think it's very important that somebody meets you when you come to some place. I mean, I think it's horrific not to be met. I mean, it's, it's just not nice. And, but I mean that, I don't mean that to be funny. I mean, I truly mean that I don't like it if, I don't, if I'm not met when I come to some place. And I know how much I like it when somebody meets me. It just, it's, it seems proper okay. to do that. Well, anything that seems so proper, you try to do. And we're going to try to do that for everybody. We're going to have an architectural holiday the first day of the convention where you get a personalized tour, maybe no more than three or four of you around the area around different architects' offices. So you go to an office and, and, and you see the city. We have a lunch program called Meet the Biggies. And uh, that's what it's called, it's called Meet the Biggies, where I'm getting 200 top politicians, um, cultural leaders, business people, bankers, sports people, and I'm trying to get somebody, I mean, this is my problem, I gotta get somebody suckered into paying for a couple thousand lunch boxes. And uh, we're gonna send five lunch boxes or so, six lunch boxes to each of these people's offices, and then you'll sit around for lunch, eating your lunch in their office, and talk to them about what do they do. I mean, what are they, that's one way of finding out. The personal way is a very good way of finding out information. What, what, it, what can be done with computer graphics, films, all the technical ways we're gonna cover in the seminars and with the film program. What you can see from a vantage point is gonna be done that way. All 13,000 teachers in the school system have gotten a program called An American City in which they're being asked to have their kids in, in a poem and a map and a model describe their neighborhood and how they navigate from home to school. The best of that is gonna be in John Wanamaker's windows. They've given us their windows. Those are Tom terrific windows. We have a program which we started called America 200 in which I've written out the requirements 
I must say with some trouble, asking each, well, 76 have said yes, believe it or not, 76 chapters of the AIA have said yes to a request to, and I think this one is going to be done through your school here, to research historic maps as close to the 50-year increment, 1776, 1826, 1876, 1926, 1976, as close to those 50-year increments as possible to find a historic map that was produced. And everybody made maps, they make them every year of every city almost. To find maps that were produced close to those 50-year increments, blow them up or reduce them to a common scale so that we have maps of the growth of urban America, historic maps of the growth of urban America, comparatively for 76 cities in the United States. The program's called America 200, and we're gonna do an exhibit and hopefully a book of that. And I hope that that's, I think it's gonna be done through the school here, but it's gonna be done hopefully a lot of places around the United States. It's a terrific idea to get a lot of people each to do a little something and it all gets pulled together. That's the way I've done, I used to do all those early books. Everybody does a model, you make them with the same skill, same technique, you put them together, you have something that makes some sense. And that's fine to do, that's really fine to do. Charlie, do you have a, you're just rubbing your face. Um, what else am I going to do? This is going to be a lot of big parties, if you like big parties. Um, it's going to be the big Dodge party, and then have somebody else give us another party like that. And then I've gotten, I'm going to have my own party. Um, none of you are invited, except Charlie, you're invited, old friends. Um, what else? I don't know what else. Have had impossible tasks. I tried to get students enlisted in Philadelphia to try to get them to help. Not as students to put up, pin up exhibits and take out trash, but I mean running some of the programs and doing some of, their, some of the stuff. But they all complained that they couldn't do it because it hits at the wrong month. It does. I didn't make the month up, May, and everybody seemed to be still in school. So I couldn't get any support from students, which I, I wanted, you know, a student to be chairman of, of things not in charge of student events and not women in charge of women events. I just want them to be in charge of some things. But that's been a failure. That hasn't worked, which is a shame. The theme is simply how do you make information understandable about the physical environment if there was really a good problem that some faculty member gave here or any other place where there's good faculty members. Could give a problem which would really be of general interest of how you can, by putting information down comparatively, or how you can look into a certain subject that has to do with making information understandable about the physical environment. I'd love you to tell me about it. We'll try to find a place to exhibit it. I'm going to get a letter out. I'm late at that because I have no secretary. It's a non-remunerative position, and I'm dying on the vine running it. But I'm going to try to get a letter out to all deans on that very soon. What else? That's about all that. Any questions about that, or have I talked too long about that? What else do I have here? Okay. Let me whiz through these slides. If people want to leave me, so these slides go very, very quickly. I won't talk very much at all about them. I have a few notes because I don't really know them all. This is put together with help from somebody in my office named uh, Joe Katz. Joe works with me. He helped on the Nature of Recreation book. He helped on a booklet I did called, I did a guidebook for Aspen called Aspen Visible. And he's helping on the book I'm working on now called Something More You Can Learn From Your Schoolhouse. And he and I, this was put together for the new, uh, what we call in the office MCO2, which stood for Making the City Observable 2, which is now going to be called the Architecture of Information. Now that you're suitably confused, let's just uh, turn off the lights and I'll push these. Oh, I put on, I do the lights. I have to do everything. What do I do? Shouldn't he focus them for me up there? Is somebody up there? Is there some lights that have to come out there too? Yeah, okay. This is just a perverse small detail. This is just all about subway maps. And I show it only as an example of if there's this much about subway maps, think of what there is about every single thing and every single thing you can communicate in the urban environment. So I'm not trying to give you a lecture on subway maps. I'll just go through these quite rapidly, and they're of some interest. The first thing on the left and the first number of slides that you're going to see 
are a person by the name of Beck, who, as you can read up there in 31, made the first sketch of a subway system in London. And this is the standard which everybody has sort of copied since then. Uh, and it was turning the map into a diagram. The value of that for you is just question, in any time you try to communi communicate information, is it better to show reality or a diagram of information? That has to do with words. Is it better to abstract something or tell about the real thing? These are just a sequence of how he took an idea and kept on changing it over here. He just drafted this himself. He was just working in an office. Nobody asked him to do this, by the way. Why is this thing on the right not changing? Is that changing on the right? No, it's not changing. There, it's changing now. Now you have sort of what it is today. These are just variations on a theme of, the, uh, of that first subway map. Something's wrong with this thing. There it is. See how complicated this one on the left gets? I didn't do that. Well, somebody else did that. OK. Huh. Let me go back. That's uh, his first rail map, and the one on the right is the present current rail map. This is the Boston map. The one on the left here is interesting because this is Cambridge Seven's map. Next week, or I think you're going to have a lecture by Ivan Chermayev. Ivan is one of the Cambridge Seven uh, group, as well as being a partner of Chermayev and Geismer. He's also on the board of the Aspen Conference, which which I'm on too. And this is the one that they did uh, in the graphic systems manual on the left. And the one on the right is the one that they then sort of uh, aborted this one on the left. And that's the one that's now published in Boston. Uh, this on the left is a, uh, is a new, the new map that Massimo Vignelli did, Unimark in New York for the New York system which doesn't work at all. It looks pretty. It uh, looks very nice, but there's an overcomplication of information there. More color than you need, more. It's just terribly difficult uh, to use. He's done a series of bus maps, which are very good. This one, to me, is a, a failure and an example of something that looks very good, but it really isn't very good. The one on the right, right is one that I did. Uh, let's go on there. Okay, these, if they were close together, is an interesting series of maps that a student of mine did, a student I had in Cambridge. In fact, this is a guy I was telling you about before, Charlie, that John Ellis did. And he's done, uh, he's from Cambridge in England, but he's uh, got very interested in the problem as I was talking to him about it, and he helped me on the one we were doing. And he's done a series just on his own, he's never done anything with them, I just have a collection of them in my office of uh, Amtrak, Amtrak maps of the United States, subway maps of New York, et cetera, and they're really just extraordinary, extraordinary collection. Well, that doesn't seem to work over there on the right, so well. This is the New York thing again. You just see how complicated that is. Uh, absolutely indecipherable to use that color chart. It has the look of looking good. And this is really a perfect example of that happened so much, and I talked about this earlier today in the lecture this afternoon for those who are still here who were there, is that it, we've judged, we've begun to judge graphics so much on what looks good and not what is good. And this would pass off in most graphic circles as saying, oh, that's terrific, that's a massive Ovignelli special, it looks good, Unimark, hurrah, hurrah. And uh, it just doesn't work. Um, just caution. This is a much clearer one. This the thing on the right doesn't work. This is a limited system map, and of course, it's, they did it, and it's very clear, and it works, and you can see the difference here. You can't, more is not better. You remember the thing in the lecture this afternoon, as well as the, the commissioner talking about knowing more. More no longer solves problems. 
more things on a drawing, more detail on a map. I remember when I went to school, the first drawings I used to do, elevations of buildings, other things, oh, I wanted to put everything on it. You know, horror of the vacuum, horror of vacui. I wanted to show how terrific I had figured everything out. Draw in every brick, put everything I could have on every drawing so it looked like I really spent time and it was complicated and I wanted the faculty to ooh and ah. Some of the faculty did, but it wasn't because I was really being, making any sense. More is not better. More information on something is not better. What's better is better. What be what's better is good. It's, what's better is what you want to communicate. Think of the piece of information you want to communicate. I forget what that one is. Oh, that's a map of Finland on the left. Rail system of Finland. This is Tokyo. There's a whole series on Tokyo here. That one doesn't seem to work very good. Here's a very good example of a diagram and a map over reality. Those are both exactly the same pieces of information. Uh, where is one better? Which is clearer? Which is easier to find your way? When do you use a diagram and when do you have something over reality? And that's philosophically a question not about maps and subway maps, and, but about your life. You know, when is it better to do... How do you ask yourself those questions? And do you at every stage of decision making? Well, that guy, okay. this slide thinks they never work. This is the BART map. That thing never changes on the right. These are the BART maps in San Francisco. They're really excellent. Look how clear that is. Of course, that's a very simple piece of information, one line. But just the whole street information is very clear. When it gets more complicated, it still is reasonably clear, some of it, until it drops off on the right. Uh, I don't know, that's just done in the BART system. I don't know the person in, uh, responsible for them. You see how confused that gets on the left. I mean, that's indecipherable. That's the Boston map uh, that's done in-house in the system of Boston, and it's really pretty good on the right. This is the SEPTA map in Philadelphia which is absolutely indecipherable. There's all the bus routes, all the rail routes, all the streets, the names of all the streets, I guess shopping centers, parks, everything is on this map. Uh, you can't, there's so much you can't read anything. And it wouldn't help you if you even chose better colors. Those are the four sections of that map. Hurrah! That's our map in black and white in color. Oh, that's just from the systems manual, the parts of just our grid is sort of high-tech and uh, proposals of how we show just a single route and a comparison to the Boston system. Uh, well, that's a good point. It's just that the, that thing in, up there, it looks like that line is going east and west, and it really doesn't, so it doesn't really show direction, which is just a comment on it. That's the same thing in Japan. That's a bastardization of our map that somebody in-house in SEPTA did and published it in one of their little booklets, which I hate. This is, uh, again, the system in Paris. The one is a, exactly the same piece of information. One on the left is a diagram, and the one on the right is uh, over reality. Uh, but in this case, uh, the actual larger map of reality, a different version of reality in Paris, works better than a diagram. Where in London, it works better as a diagram. This is the larger version in Paris, and it works very, very well over the reality better than the diagram. The diagram just confuses a system which has very close stops, only a thousand meters apart, and it's really not appropriate to make it into a diagram as it is in London, which over reality would be see utterly confusing geometry. Here, because of the color coding and other things, you can follow lines very easy. If you've been to Paris, you know you can. And you don't even have to speak the language at all. Well, I won't belabor these points. I don't think this is really of high interest to everybody, but I'm, I'm a map freak. That's a 
a map on the left in that little marvelous little book called Nicholson's Guide to England, which looks very good and it's, it's unusable. Can't use it at all. Looks good again. That's uh, one of the bus maps of New York, which are really, they're fairly good. And actually it works with this schedule on the right, which is color coded by direction, east, west, north, south. I don't know why I have that back on. Oh, these are two versions, again, of Philadelphia maps that are unintelligible. And ours, which is supposedly better. This is one system in the land, I think, on the left, where they tried to code everything by quadrants. And it uh, might have been a good idea, but it's very confusing to fake up the city arbitrarily in squares like that. It makes it difficult to use. That's the same information on the right. This is uh, unintelligible. I think I forget what city this is. I think it's Houston or something. That's your standard map of cities usually. Is that it? Hello. That's it. The book we're doing has uh, goes into each kind of map like that. It's a rather lengthy book, but it goes into every single kind of mapping with a commentary of why each one is good, what it's trying to do, why it's bad, what it could lead to, or what permutations of it could lead to. But it not only goes into mapping, it goes into educational programs that use the urban environment, into photography, into computer graphics, film, um, some written things, figures, diagrams, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it interests me. It's sort of a down place to end. Somebody ask an up question and then we can finish it. Anybody have an up question? Yes, sir. It might be helpful to relate the kind of analysis you're trying to make with the kind of story you're trying to tell. Like Um, boy, I hope I could do that. My fascination with th those is really I find all the things I do as an exercise for how to make a decision in architecture or make a decision in planning or make a decision about everything. To me, making a map, the decision of making a map is a very pure kind of visual decision making. Uh, I really like that as an exercise. And I find that making that decision is exactly the same way I would think of saying what chapter should go into a book on career education. To me, it's exactly the same thing. Perhaps it wouldn't be to somebody else, but I, I see that, that parallel. Uh, one of the books I have outlined, which probably won't get done for a couple of years, is called The Book of Parallels. And the idea of that book is to show the parallels between the natural environment and the man-made environment. For instance, what does numbers of things mean in the man-made environment? What does numbers of things mean in the, in the natural environment? Numbers of blades of grass in a square foot, or so, and why? Numbers of trees or animals, or just the, all things that have to do with numbers, magnitudes in the natural environment, and what are the things that have to do with magnitudes in the man-made environment? Number of people, cars, certain dimensioning, and what's similar and what is different between the cutoff points for numbers and numbers of things. And how by understanding the natural environment, you can get an insight into the man-made environment and vice versa. Or how can you, by not understanding either, can you maybe understand something about both? It has 10 chapters, this book. It's all, I have a big, thick outline of it. It goes into uh, levels. You know, what goes on above grade, at grade, and below grade both the natural and the man-made environment. And how do you draw the parallels? No, you've lost me. But it might not be your fault.
Oh, okay. I think I understand you there, and then I agree with I agree with what you're saying. But I, I still think there's another question there of how can I really explain this as a useful learning device for what I'm trying to project, and I can't do that well enough. And I would like to think about that. Well, I think it's useful too. I just I can't make I can't make the jump. I, I, I find everything I talk about as a useful vehicle, that's why I do it. I pursue vehicles which somehow feel right to me because of some clarity. To me, a map and the whole idea of a map, which is a terrific abstraction of information, probably the purest visual abstraction of information that we commonly use, is a marvelous vehicle for training my head about how to do a building. I, but I, I, I'm just saying that. You have no reason to take that on my word. I'm telling you something that I can't explain well enough and shouldn't be in front of on a podium saying it at this moment. But I do believe it. Uh, I think we've talked just long enough. Good night.